Hey, I'm Sion, the Unexpected Maker. In a previous life, I was a game developer, and one of the holy grails on making games for mobile phones was to make the ultimate one-tap game, where the whole game mechanic revolved around just a single tap on the screen. So when I started playing with Arduinos and microcontrollers, of course I wanted to build a game, and I wanted to see if I could make a one-tap microcontroller-based game. And I did, and I did that a year and a half ago, and my kids loved it, and then it got put on the shelf, and I didn't touch it. Until now, I thought I'd resurrect it, and build it, and make a video on how to make it, supply the code, put together a Hackster.io project, and let other people share the fun of Pixel Chaser, the game. Okay, well I'm going to build this with a Nano, just because it seems to be a board that a lot of people have, so it should be quite accessible. You can use any microcontroller. We need a ring. It doesn't have to be a ring, it could be a strip, it'll work the same way, but a ring is kind of fun. Of NeoPixels, these are just uh, WS2812s, and there are 24 in the ring. 24 is what I had on hand. The smaller the ring, the harder the game, and I've just got the power, ground, and the data in, soldered up to the back. Okay, what else do we need? A breadboard, because this is just going to be a breadboard project. Uh, I might make it a bit sturdier and put it on a proto board at some point. We need a button. We're going to need a 10K resistor. You can see it just there. <laughs> and we're going to need some breadboard wires. That's really it. It's a, a fairly simple build. Let's get going. Now let's start off with the breadboard. We'll get the nano and we'll put that on. Let's get it right to the edge. Okay, and we're going to want the button on, and we want the button to be as far away from all the wiring as possible. So it's easy to get to, so I'm going to stick it down the end just here. Got a nice blue cap on the button. Blue is my favourite colour. Okay, now we need to pull the button down to ground, and we want to do that and keep all the wiring away from the button, just so my kids don't pull the wires out as we're going. So what I'm going to do is make the resistor quite wide here all the way to ground, just so it's nice and low and out of the way. Okay, we're also going to need to take the button high when it's being pushed. So we're going to need a jumper just here to go to the high rail. We'll power that up in a moment. How about yellow? Perfect. Okay, so the button's going to be pulled low all the time, and when you push it, it's going to go high. And we need the resistor there so we don't just have a short with power going straight to the ground. Okay, we also need to connect up the button for when you press it to D3 in this case, or just pin 3. So I need a cable to reach there. Maybe this red one will be a good size, although red should be normally for power. Hmm, it's not great, but that's okay. We'll use it for now. Now, I could just use normal DuPont wires, but then they stick up and they get in the way of the button, so I just didn't want to do that. So that's not very neat. I know, but it's all about functionality. So that's going to get pulled to ground always until you press a button and it'll go high. Cool. Now, we need to wire up our RGB LED ring. So I'm going to go ground to ground. I just want it out the way again. Maybe they'll play it this way where it's next to it. So if I go ground to ground, We'll go power to power, and we'll go data to D4, or digital pin 4. So that's kind of out the way, and they can get to the button quite easily. And now I just need to take power and ground from the microcontroller to the rails, and then we're done. And as I said, it's a pretty simple build, <laughs> but that's okay. So 5 volts goes to 5 volts. And I could probably get away with an orange one for the ground. Ground is here, goes to ground. Really simple build. Let's just zoom out and plug it in and see what happens, shall we? Okay, so I've got my mini B controller. Does it power up? It does. So, there's a time delay before it starts. So it's a one button. Wow, I died. So let me just turn some lighting down so you can see the LEDs a bit better. Okay, so I've got a score of three <laughs> right now. 
We'll have a look at the code in a moment, but just to show you the functionality, you do a long press to reset the game. So long press, and it shows you where the coin is and the enemy. And then you, you try to get the yellow without touching the red. Whoa. And so my best score is shown in yellow. It's a bit hard to see that that's yellow with the lighting. And if my last score was less than my best score, it'll show that portion of it in red. So I'll do a reset again. We'll see how well I can go. I've got stage fright doing this on video. And so it gets faster and faster. Whoa. Get a bit tentative. Oh. Damn. There you go. So obviously if your high score is higher than what the ring can show, well, yep. Yeah, it doesn't lap or anything. I could probably change the code to do that. So that's the game, basically. You've got the gold coin that you need to collect. You're the green player. And the red guy is the enemy. There are lots of things that the game can be extended to do which I haven't really done. There could be multiple enemies on there, or the enemy could be moving. I think things like that are just going to make it really hard for the player to play. Um, it's definitely a skill timing game, and most of the high scores you get are as much fluke as anything else. But it's pretty fun. Uh, let's have a look at the code. Okay, I'm not going to do a complete deep dive on the code, because looking at code in video is pretty boring. But I will be releasing a Hackster IO project for the Pixel Chaser game, and I'll include the code inside there. The project should be out, hopefully, on the same day that I release this video. The code itself is using the Adafruit NeoPixel library and the One Button library. Both of those are available in Library Manager. We're just setting up the pins for the pixels and the buttons, initializing the number of pixels. There's a whole bunch of variables here. I'm not going to go through and explain what each one is. It's pretty straightforward once you look through the code down below. I'm assigning a single click and a long click to the button. Turning on the pixels, setting the brightness to 20. You can make them as bright as you want, but obviously the brighter they are, the more power they take. The loop's pretty simple. We just tick the button every cycle. If it, there's a game over state, don't do anything else. Uh, otherwise, we call set level every frame, which we'll have a look at in a moment. There's a two second pause at the start, so the player doesn't start moving straight away. Display player basically does the whole game logic in here. Ooh, logics, should be logic. <laughs> and um, at the end we show the pixels. So there's a clear level which sets everything to black. The best score method goes through and does a yellow animation for the current score and then if your last score was less than the best score it shows it in red as well. The game over state basically does two animations from the point where the enemy was it animates out two circular rings and then it waits half a second and then it animates black rings to clear them and then it shows the best score. The setup level basically runs every cycle and does nothing if either of the enemy or the coin has already been set on the level. But if there's no enemy in the level, it goes through and picks a position for the enemy. If there's no coin in the level because the player's picked up a coin, it finds a new place and places a new coin. And then it updates the position of these two. Display play is where all the logic happens. It's running through and only runs every play speed loop. So it's not running at you know, 60 frames a second. It'll get faster as the play gets faster. The actual player pixel has a, a trail behind it. And so the next two sections here are just to do the trail. The player then gets moved by its player direction. Remember, it's a one button game. So when you hit the button, the player direction just changes to plus one or negative one. I've got some code here that checks the wrapping. So it adjusts itself for the wrapping of the ring, sets the pixel color for the player. And then it just goes through and does a, a few logic things. So if the player is at the coin index, it resets the enemy in coin position, it increases the score, and it increases the speed of the player. If the player hits the enemy index, it does a game over, sets the last score and the best score, and resets some variables. Again, pretty straightforward. Single click just changes the player direction, and obviously you can't do that while the two second countdown's happening. And a long click will basically switch between the game over states. So if it wasn't the game over, it makes a game over. And if it was a game over, it resets the game. So that means you can actually exit the game in the middle of the game if you want to stop playing. Or you can just not press the button and let the player die. And that's it. That's all the code.